Okay, let's continue. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Belinda Cerda. Uh, she's from Cambridge English. She's the head of assessment services for Spain and Portugal. And um, since joining Cambridge English in uh, 2007, she has worked on and managed the test production process on a number of high stakes exams and educational projects. Uh, countries uh, uh, so vari varied, like Kazakhstan, Colombia, Chile, Italy, Mongolia, Spain, and Portugal, in collaboration with the ministries of education of these different countries. Uh, she, was, she has uh, also 20 years experience in English language teaching, um, teacher training, curriculum design, and assessment in the UK, Spain, and Germany. Her research interests include bilingualism and identity. So uh, it's been a pleasure working with Belinda these uh, last months, and I hope we'll continue our work together. So the floor is yours, Belinda. Thank you very much, Liz. That's very kind. It all sounds very impressive. <laughs> um, so Liz has told you a little bit about myself, about me. And what I'd like to do, first of all, before I start talking about principles of assessment, is share what I know about you. So I don't know, some of you might remember about two weeks ago we sent out a survey to all the English teachers in the audience who'd registered for the event. So what I'm going to do is just share some of the results of the survey and that way you know who's sitting next to you, who's sitting behind you and who you'll be working with in the workshops tomorrow. Okay, so this is about you, the audience. So who are you? Um, approximately 80% of you teach in state schools. No, sorry, about 70% of you teach English in primary school. So we have more primary school teachers here today than secondary school teachers. Okay, approximately 80% of you teach in state schools. And then I don't know if you can see it, but about 13% teach in concertados. Okay, do you teach in a bilingual program was another one of the questions. And I think approximately 80% of you are teaching a bilingual program already. Another question was, do you have another role in your school? And over half of you, in addition to your teaching role, have another role. So you're either a bilingual coordinator or an ICT coordinator or something else. So we've got a lot of people here who are teachers and in their not spare time have other roles. Okay, years of experience. I think we've got a very experienced audience. 30% um, of you have been teaching English for 7 to 15 years. And then approximately 20% have been teaching English for over 20 years. Okay, so very experienced. We also asked some other questions um, in the survey. So we had a mixture of open and closed questions. So in keeping with the Cambridge exams, we had different tasks, different questions. And one of the open uh, questions was, what makes a good exam? So you shared your ideas um, with me or with us, and this will form the basis of the next uh, 25 minutes. In addition to the results that you gave me and the points you gave me, we also recorded some teachers. About two weeks ago, we interviewed some teachers, and we asked them what makes a good exam. So I'm going to share, share with you this, this video. And it's a homemade video, probably a bit like what you do with your students. So it's a two-minute video, what makes a good exam? And this is what the teachers in Spain say. We hope the sound works. We've checked it a few times, so... Uh, we talk a lot in my 
all about the sweet spot that students have, and you should access this this area that's you know a little bit challenging for them, but not too easy. And I think that's ideally what an exam should do. It should test their level adequately. should be student friendly so that when students feel comfortable um, they feel that they're being fairly assessed on a pre-tested and well programmed uh, exam. I think that, uh, that a good exam is um, something that makes sense first of all for the student so it's like um, it's about the relevance of the exam and uh, the level between student and the exam so and also the purpose of the exam so I think that the students have to know clearly the aim and the uh, reasons why they are going to take the exam. Well, I think that uh, it's very important when you, when you do an exam that um, students feel that they can do it so yeah. that they are not afraid of it because then if not it's really stressful. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, like it's, uh, it's a tool to make them uh, feel confident about uh, what they have learned. So I think that it should be that a tool to make them improve mm -hmm. and, and not just uh, getting a mark. And so it would be good to make them feel confident about what they have learned. Sure. Yeah, so that then you can use uh, what they did in the exam, uh, I don't know, to check for more understanding. Yeah, I think, I think it's important so that, that you can have a look at their mistakes and try to learn from them. So I think that if they feel confident, I don't know, I think that they can learn more from what from the yeah. exam. Yeah. yeah. From, from even from the questions. From the exam. exam. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> So this is what Spanish speakers, uh, Spanish speakers, Span well, English speakers, Spanish speakers, and Spanish teachers in Spain said made, makes a good exam. So just to go over some of it, because um, I know some of it wasn't clear. So they talked about an exam has to be um, realistic, authentic, and meaningful. It should be student friendly. It should test the level. One of the teachers talked about this sweet spot. So she said that an exam shouldn't be neither too difficult nor too easy. They also said that one, one of the teachers, I think she was um, one of the British uh, teachers, talked about a, a good exam should be pre-tested and well-constructed. It should be relevant and motivating. This was quite interesting, and I think this goes back to what, what was asked earlier about formative feedback. It gives students and teachers information about what they can do. So a good exam should then go on to inform learning. It should measure what it claims to measure, and it must test real-life skills or real-life language. Okay, this is what you said in the survey. So I've just summarized the video for you. This is what you all said in the survey two weeks ago. And I think there's... Um, real similarities, the same comments, the same uh, issues are coming up among you teachers but also teachers surveyed in other parts of Spain. So relevance and significance for people, not too long. Everyone mentioned the four skills. So a good exam, a good language exam, a good English language exam should assess all the skills. They should be fair and objective, they should be reliable they should be precisely tailored and interesting questions. They should motivate. And then the last teacher talked about teaching and not only grading. Clear. And then a mix of open and closed questions. One of the teachers talked about having different task types. So multiple choice. And this is something that someone here mentioned in one of the surveys that a, te a language test that's all multiple choice um, doesn't allow creative people to show what they know. 
So all of these uh, ideas and opinions that you shared in some ways are the principles of assessment. So I could actually stop there after nine minutes. But what I'm going to do is talk about them at length a little bit more. And I'm going to describe how in Cambridge English we've taken all the things that you think and harnessed and put them into a framework that we're able to work with. And I think this is a framework that any responsible testing organisation should be using when designing a good language test. So we internally refer this to as RIPQ, which sounds a bit like a rock band or something, and it's validity, reliability, impact and practicality. So all of the things that you said in your survey makes a good exam come under these four areas. So if we look at each one in turn, I won't go into a lot of detail, but I'll just mention what it is and how it works in, in Cambridge English and in other um, responsible testing organisations. So validity is that it assesses what it claims to assess, and it's an accurate measure of a student's ability. So if a student is A2, they are A2, and this language test is showing that their English is at A2 level. So how do we do this? How do we ensure that a test is valid? There are a number of ways that you can do this. Um, one of the ways that you can do this is by having a test that has different task types. Okay, so you can have a mixture of multiple choice, open and closed questions. Another way you can do this is by having tests at different levels. So, for example, we we have all these levels from A2 up to C2 in Cambridge English so that we're sure that each test is assessing at the right level. Okay, another way that we do this in Cambridge English is by having what we call an item banking system. So we have one um, measurement scale and we can align all our items in our test to this measurement scale and it means that we can create multiple versions of tests that all have the same level of difficulty. So we're able to say that the first certificate that you took in May is of the same difficulty level as the first certificate that was taken in June. Okay, because we have this item banking system that I, ha I think has about 200,000 or 300,000 items in it and it allows us a kind of mix and match of, of tests. So that's validity. Reliability is is, are the test scores um, accurate and reliable or accurate and consistent? So how do we ensure this? So how do we ensure that when Carlos takes first in Madrid on Tuesday and then he takes first, say again, because he feels like it, in Paris on uh, Saturday, that he would get the same result in both exams? So how do we ensure that it's consistent? So we can do this through a number of ways, and I won't go into all of them, but one of, the days, one of the ways we do this is to ensure that the conditions in which students take an exam is the same regardless of where in the world they're taking the exam. So it doesn't matter if they take it on a Saturday, on a Tuesday, in China or in Spain, the standards are the same and the conditions are the same, and they all have the same opportunity, okay, so equal access. So in terms of the actual environment they're in, where they sit and how far apart they sit from each other is important. So that everyone has the same, um, same uh, not the ability, the same opportunity. And there's not some people in some countries who are able to look more closely at the answers of their partner. <laughs> also, we have standard uh, instructions for what students can have with them. Okay, and this is quite important. So you're not allowed to have a dictionary. And that's the same all around the world. So everyone's got the same um, opportunity. And then again, what they can and can't see in the exam room. So students should be able to see a clock, but they shouldn't be able to see English notices around the room. Okay, so this ensures that um, the results are consistent. Another way that you can ensure consistency of results is, to, is by ensuring that your examiners, so your writing examiners or your speaking examiners, all have had a standardised training. Okay, so from recruitment training, certification, and then a, a, a procedure, a process that, is, that means that they have ongoing training. So in Cambridge English, examiners recertificate every year and they carry out standard standardisation every year. So that means that all the examiners are assessing at the same level 
and this is really important because we, if you take an exam in Spain it's got to be an A2 has to be an A2 in Spain and it has to be an A2 in France and so all the examiners around the world have the same um, have had the same training and are assessing at the same level okay I'll move on now to talk about impact and this is something that's uh, been spoken about today and this is really important and sometimes neglected and this is ensuring that an exam has a positive impact on society and on individuals and when I'm talking about society I also mean about on the educational community so an exam has a positive impact on learning and teaching okay and an exam is encouraging um, real life so the tasks that are in an exam are the kind of tasks that a student would find in the real world okay so impact is very important and then finally practicality so the resource needed to create and administer an exam is important because you might have a fantastic exam but if it's so expensive to administer that nobody can do it in any country then then it then it has a negative impact okay so those are the four main principles and they're all and quality kind of runs throughout and what I want to do now is just a little activity I want you to have a look at these four issues and with the person sitting next to you can you decide what's what's the problem here is it validity is it reliability is it negative impact or is it impracticality so just with the person next to you two minutes What's the issue in these different scenarios? And you can talk amongst yourselves. How long have I got? So maybe 10 minutes. Okay, shall we have a look at them together? Don't worry if you haven't finished. We'll just have a look at the first one. So a candidate's essay is marked by two different examiners and gets wildly different results. Um, what is that? Validity, reliability, impact, or practicality? Can everyone shout out? A bit louder. Exactly. Yes, reliability. Okay, so reliability, issue of reliability here, and this is when we, what I talked about, about standardization and examiner training to ensure that everyone's assessing at the, at the same level. Okay, I've just given you the answer. The next one, <laughs> sorry. A test of English that contains a mathematical problem. Correct. How did you know? So um, it's not a valid exam. Okay, an English test, an English exam should assess English. If it includes maths or world knowledge, then it's not fair. You know, it's not a valid result or a valid exam. A test, I mean, that was an easy one. A test that costs too much to deliver is 
practicality. Thank you, Liz, <laughs> from the INE. <laughs> Okay, and then the last one, the high percentage of candidates receiving an A grade means that universities cannot choose between the candidates. Impact. Okay, so the impact here is for everyone, but especially for the university, who then has to decide or choose an alternative, perhaps less reliable way of uh, selecting their students. So here it's impact. Okay, so there are the four principles, the key principles, and I think uh, contained in these, included in these, are all the things that you said in your survey about uh, different task types, fairness, reliability, impact on teaching, etc. And kind of weaved throughout all of these principles is um, this idea of quality. Okay, so how do you ensure quality? If you're an assessment board, if you're in a testing organisation, how do you ensure that you have high quality exams? And of course there are again a number of ways of doing this. I'll just highlight one or two. So we have in Cambridge a constant process of we plan, we do, we check what we've done and then we revise what we've done to improve the next stage. And this goes through all our procedures and processes. So for example, if I show you the question paper production cycle, it takes two years to create a first certificate exam. Okay, so it's quite a long time. And the reason it's such a long time is because of all these stages. Okay, so we start with commissioning of material. Then once we've commissioned the material, the, the item writers, they go away, they write the material, then we pre-edit it. Once um, they send it in, we pre-edit it. Then we either reject um, well, the options are to reject, then if we don't reject it, it goes through to editing. And all these processes and procedures, it takes approximately two years and it involves a mixture of internal and external consultants. So we have teams of what we call assessment managers in Cambridge Research and Validation Officers, etc., who are responsible for, um, for this process. But going back to this quality idea, the idea is that you're constantly improving. So by the time a candidate sees a first certificate exam, we know that there isn't a mistake in there. We know that the test is reliable. We know that it's of a good quality because we've constantly been reviewing. Each item is seen by hundreds of people. Okay? Each exam is edited, pre-edited and proofread about 10 times as well. So this is quality and this is at the heart of everything. And then again, examiner assessment and training and standardization, this also ensures quality. So these are the key principles or the principles of assessment. Um, I'll now move on to the final question which I posed to you in the survey. And this is what do you want to take from the event? So what do you want to learn from Cambridge English today and tomorrow? And I know what we would like to give. So in tomorrow's workshops, we want to raise awareness of what makes a good speaking item and what makes a good writing item. Okay, we also want to give you practice assessing uh, some scripts and some real uh, candidates, okay, and to give you some feedback. And there's a third goal, okay, but this goal was given to me by, by, um, by yourselves. Um, many of you mentioned knowledge and strategies to further teaching English as a foreign language. So there was lots of talk about strategies. There was uh, suggestions for new ideas. Lots of you in the survey said you would like new ideas, practical ideas, refresher ideas. There was also mention about bilingualism and peer, uh, conversations with peers. I think a conference like this is an excellent opportunity to talk to teachers from other schools, from other regions, and find out what they're doing, and also find out how they're feeling. Okay, so in Madrid there's a bilingual program. What experience, what does that mean for everyone? So, and that's something that you can do in the coffee breaks, that's something that we can do in the Q&A. So sharing experience and sharing resources. Each workshop will have a facilitator, and that person is, is sharing their knowledge, but you're also sharing knowledge with each other. And then strategies again. Ideas, strategies, sharing, I think are three key words. And then the last goal for tomorrow and for today, but the goal that was given to the INE and to Cambridge English by you all was an unforgettable experience, someone put. So I'm not sure we can guarantee that unless I fall off the stage or something like that. But um, I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening.
Okay, thank you very much, Belinda. Um, I have to announce that we won't have a, a break, so because we are a bit, uh, you know, in a delayed schedule, about half an hour. So, but if you would uh, like to share some of your reflections or some questions you pose to Belinda, you're welcome. Okay. No questions. Will they all come tomorrow then in the workshops? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Belinda. Bye. Go on. Our next session now on best practices. Okay.